Hello and welcome everybody. It's great to have you here for our Making Sense PA webinar. Uh, happy Financial Literacy Month here in Pennsylvania as it's April again. Uh, Governor Shapiro did just uh, recently proclaim April as Financial Literacy Month. So it's great to be here with you, um, celebrate with uh, this focus on financial education and talk about paying for college. So our agenda this afternoon uh, features um, a fantastic guest uh, speaker with us here from Penn State. But before we kick that off, I want to talk through just a few things. One is um, um, if you have a chance, go ahead and open your um, your chat area. Make sure that you uh, use that drop down to select all hosts um, and panelists, so that both Julie and I can see your responses. If you get a minute to to share in there, your grade level, subject area. Um, district and county, um, you know, I, I always like to say, you know, there's 500 school districts and I've been doing this for 20 years, but I still don't have them all memorized, um, but I'm pretty good with the counties. So if you include your county, that'll help us to sort of orient um, where everybody is from. And then, you know, what do you do with financial education? Are you teaching a course? Do you have a, a unit or a lesson? Um, what have you? Um, that would be incredibly helpful for us um, as we move forward. So um, again, before I kick it off, just a few things here on behalf of the Making Sense Project. We are a partnership between the Pennsylvania Department of Education and Penn State University. Um, and these webinars are a part of that, um, that uh, collaborative effort. With these um, series, we always try and do one of one or more of three things, really enhance content knowledge, which you may get a bit of that today as well, highlight financial literacy resources and share professional information. I dare say we might almost be on all three legs of that three legged stool um, here this afternoon. We have some other additional webinars if you haven't had a chance to check those out. Um, next week, I'll be presenting uh, a session on NEFI's financial well-being ecosystem, in particular, how that might um, be uh, utilized and thought about um, both as a, as a K-12 educator, as well as with your students, in particular, high school students. Um, then we have Andrew Hill joining us on April 18th to talk about um, how to talk about inflation uh, with students. Andrew is with the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and is always a fantastic and um, very appreciated uh, presenter here on our Making Sense webinars. So hope you can sign up for that one. I'll be doing a status update on personal finance education here in Pennsylvania, what we're seeing in terms of trends and who's teaching it, where it is, um, sort of the latest and greatest on everything financial education, including potentially if there's been any updates to um, legislation being introduced this, um, this year. And then we'll round that out with um, a session on May 9th. Uh, on Get Smart with Money, a documentary series or a documentary um, movie that's available on Netflix and some thoughts on how you can use that with students. Um, we also have some asynchronous opportunities coming up to book studies, one on um, Broke Millennial Talks Money starting in May, and then the other one on the psychology of money, which is June 11th to July 8th. So um, we welcome your involvement in those. Those are um, four week programs. We tackle um, a section of the book each week, and I provide a bunch of, um, of discussion prompts. So you pick which one you want to respond to and then um, respond as well to several, um, at least two of your, of your um, fellow participants in order to earn um, Act 48 hours. Those are 10 hours each of Act 48 credit. Um, last but not least, in the PD section, um, we are doing um, a three-week virtual uh, workshop that is actually kicking off this Sunday. Um, I am putting the finishing touches on that literally as we speak. In fact, um, I will likely be uh, recording my welcome video um, for that a little bit later today. So if you see me in the same, uh, same look and feel here, <laughs> you'll know where that came from. Um, but in this session, we are going to be spending time, this is completely asynchronous and no, um, no uh, prescribed schedule, really. We're going to be looking at our six big ideas from the personal finance framework, and then we put together kind of this choice board um, for you to pick and choose how you want to, to share resources. So this really is like a big virtual resource sharing um, workshop. Come and share a unit plan, a favorite lesson, a digital resource, like say, for example, a video or a, um, a favorite online calculator, maybe a project that you use with students, an assessment, 
Um, the challenging topic one is, you know, it's something that either you find challenging to teach and are looking for assistance with, or something that you really find challenging for your students, and again, are looking for ways to maybe make that a little bit more engaging or um, get them to, to understand that content. Um, finally, sort of, you know, an engaging uh, uh, kickoff or way to start things, um, and then looking at key terms. So, again, a lot of a lot of options and choice for each and every one of these assignments that you do. You'll get fifteen points. Um, those points are basically going to work like minutes. So, for each assignment, you get a quarter of an hour, basically, of Act Forty Eight credit. Um, you have to get at least three hours worth for us to submit it, um, and then we'll do that up to a maximum of 10 hours. So it's really going to be flexible. You can put in as much or as little to that as you want. Um, and uh, I failed to mention it earlier, but the QR code on your screen will take you directly to the, the registration where you can register for um, one or as, uh, as, as few as one or as many as all of the rest of the upcoming events that we have um, coming up. Um, last but not least, um, if you haven't joined our Facebook group on uh, on Facebook, I would encourage you to do that um, and uh, join us over there for um, a little bit of sort of behind the scenes um, chat and discussion and, and resource sharing as well. And so with that, it is my pleasure to welcome uh, Julie Heaton. Julie um, heads up Penn State's uh, Sokolov Miller Financial and Life Skills Center. Uh, she is relatively new to Pennsylvania, um, having come here to um, head up this um, fantastic effort at Penn State. Um, the, the center has been around for a little while, but this is um, a new role for Julie, and um, I'm really excited about what she's doing um, here in the Commonwealth to support um, Penn State students and, you know, really her creative vision for sort of looking beyond, um, in particular, with the pipeline of students that, that you know, so many of, of Penn State students obviously are coming from um, Pennsylvania um, uh, high schools. So, Julie, I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, welcome aboard, um, or welcome. Julie is going to be using Nearpod, so we're going to do something a little bit different here. She's going to be pushing out um, a link here in a moment, but um, Julie, I'm going to turn things over to you, and as soon as you're ready for me to stop sharing my screen and have people focus completely on you, you let me know, okay? <laughs> yeah, you can go ahead and do that. Hot seat's on. Um, <laughs> so uh, first of all, go ahead and Go to the chat. I noticed that at least I can't see yet where folks' names and schools or districts are coming in. So if you haven't already done that, I do want to know who's in the room um, so that I know who I'm speaking to. Like, where are you working? Are you an educator in K-12? Are you in higher ed? Are you an administrator? Um, so go ahead and go to the chat and uh, be entering that information. Hillary, if I can't see that for some other panelist reason, let me know. But I'm not seeing anything just yet. Uh, I also have a link in the chat, so you've got to go there in order to participate in the Nearpod slides. So head to the chat. The link should be in there now twice, just in case. And I'll I'll sort of use as confirmation that folks' names are coming in, <laughs> um, that they're also getting the link. Yep, we have folks um, putting some of that into the Q and A. So oh, okay, gotcha. And All right. Yeah, I, apologies. It's saying that the, the chat is disabled. I will try and work on that uh -oh. on my back end, but uh, we, let's see, we need to get everyone to Nearpod. So how can I get them the link? Um, I type an answer. Can you get it there? Let's try this. Chat is disabled, Hillary. I'm going to send the Nearpod link. <laughs> in that answered question so we're going to get creative folks so go to yes, kevin's comment ready. chats disabled <laughs> and click that nearpod link i think our chat um, issue has been fixed my apologies everybody i just enabled that that everybody should be able to chat with everyone now Great. Great. And then let us know if anything. Great. Okay. Now I'm seeing it. Kevin. Hi. And uh, give me a thumbs up. Just one person knowing that you got into Nearpod. It's working successfully. Yes. Lisa, you're, I love teaching educators, man. Lisa, thank you for letting me know that you're in there. So Nearpod, if this is a new platform for you, welcome to Nearpod. I 
really recommend it. It takes a little bit of uh, finagling to get from your Zoom page over to your web browser. But in general, once you get to that web browser, we don't have to move around. There's no screen sharing or anything. If you have two monitors, Nearpod is excellent because you can have on one monitor my face and the chat and the Q&A. And then on the other monitor, you can have Nearpod up. So essentially, I'm sharing my slides with you um, via your browser. So it looks like you guys are mostly getting in there um, and viewing the slides. What is also bet you weren't ready for a tutorial on Nearpod, but what is also wonderful about using Nearpod is that all of the links are live in Nearpod. So you're going to be able to click if I say, oh, and this is a link that goes to this calculator. You can click the link on the slide and it will open up a second page on your browser. So you don't leave the slides, but a second, um, a second page where you can actually look through that resource while I'm talking about it. So interact with the slides, click around. Hopefully you've seen this before and it won't be totally novel to you, but if it is, um, I, I hope you kind of enjoy that feature. That feature is gonna be really helpful today because what we're talking about is paying for college. And I usually give this presentation to folks uh, that are maybe unaware of the paying for college process, or they're starting that process because it's quite personal to them. They're about to send a student to school. They are themselves a student. They wanna know about costs, et cetera. Um, but from, for, for this webinar, I want to acknowledge that most of us are educators and we're in the business of making sure that students are financially uh, prepared and financially well before we send them off to college, ideally, right? So I want to use this opportunity as, an, as a way to bridge the conversation between educators on the higher ed end in financial wellness and educators on the K-12 side as well. So what are perceptions and feedback that you have about what are students, what do students know, what do they need to know, um, and what questions are you getting about paying for college? Before we get into that, let me just do a quick overview of uh, where, where I work and, and what we do. So uh, we're a team of financial educators in the Sokolov Miller Family Financial and Life Skills Center at Penn State. Uh, on the screen, you can see some of the formats with which we engage with students and the Penn State community, uh, offering presentations, webinars, asynchronous study modules, mentoring, and one-on-one -on -one appointments. Um, we are at absolutely no additional charge to the Penn State community, but we're also a public source of information because our self-study modules in Canvas, totally free and open to the public, and our group presentations and webinars are also um, ac accessible no matter who you are. You don't even have to be a Pennsylvanian. So it's a really wonderful resource, and we're, we're happy um, to have the support of Penn State and the Sokolov Miller family to allow us to do this. So let's kick things, oops, let's kick things off on your screen. You should see a little engagement. This is a cork board. Um, we wanted, I want to hear from you first. So what do you believe students need further education on as it relates to paying for college? So if you share your thoughts in that lower bracket or that lower text box, you can also share a GIF. I will, I will do that myself just so you can see how that pops up. Hopefully folks are able to do that. If you have an issue with it, put it in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Crystal, thank you. How to find scholarships and understand the difference between loans and grants. Excellent. Yep, we're going to be talking about the different buckets of money that are available to students. How much college is really going to cost them? The total cost of attendance. And we're going to cover today, why is that so hard to find out? opportunity cost of education or lack thereof. <laughs> That's a great, uh, we're going to address some of that, uh, obviously not exhaustive, Kevin, but this idea of why, you know, why are we even going on to, or why are we even paying for degrees in higher education and what are we hoping to get out of it? Uh, look for scholarships, look at the cost of education and what you will make yearly. Yep. How to do that career planning. Great. No other gifts. I'm the only one. <laughs> All right. 
Well, thanks for sharing that a little bit. I'm I'm going to offer some of our insights as well, kind of from this um, the side of meeting with students who are already enrolled, um, or maybe even at the end of their higher ed experience, and what we hear from them. Um, so, what they're coming in with, if they had uh, any kind of financial education experience in K twelve or not. Um, so, but let's start with this. Why, why are we, why even invest in your, in higher education, um, especially when there is a high cost associated with it sometimes? Well, um, the research is out there on this and it's pretty exhaustive and there's, there are increased job opportunities um, for those, for those with a higher education degree. Um, higher education is an opportunity to pursue passions and interests uh, with the help of the academy, right? With the help of mentors and scholars that you might not have had access to otherwise. Uh, it's an opportunity to network build. This is still very much true about why, uh, why we pay for the experience of being a part of a higher ed community is that the networking, um, that the networks provide us with job opportunities, professional opportunities, and interpersonal opportunities to connect with others. And also increased outcomes, health outcomes. There is a lot of research that shows that those that get go on to a, get a higher level of education um, will have increased health outcomes throughout their life. Uh, and, and this is important to note because when we talk about financial education, we're talking about financial wellness. And we're talking about this idea that um, money stress, right? We, we are financial educators because we believe that helping people deal with their finances will help reduce overall stress in their lives. Um, a, a recent study from the American Psychological Association showed that money stress is linked to insomnia and cardiovascular problems due to that chronic stress that can be caused by money. So what's so important about noting that in my mind is that what we're doing does have impacts, not just on a financial wellness point of view, but on a physical and mental health mental health uh, wellness point of view as well. Uh, not that there's always that direct correlation that we see in a day-to-day -day with students, but these are some of the reasons that, you know, why folks, a lot of folks choose to invest in higher education, sometimes quite a bit of money. There's also this quite powerful um, uh, information and research about lifetime earning potential. So what do I mean by lifetime earning potential? It's pretty simple. The higher level of degree, the, the more likely you are going to be a higher income earner in your life. Maybe not right away. So sometimes this is hard to convince, you know, high school students of, you know, especially if they're going, going to go into debt immediately upon um, going into college uh, and their friends who immediately go into the workforce could be earning more than them. But generally as your degree level increases, your lifetime earning potential increases. So as you can see on the screen, this is Georgetown University's Center on Education and the Workforce. Uh, I really also highly recommend checking out a lot of the resources that come out of um, out of Georgetown on uh, education and the workforce. I know there were some questions about uh, potential careers. It's another great resource to use if you're having these critical discussions with students. So uh, how much money are we talking about when we talk about paying for college? The reason why, I would love to say that there's a sticker price, right, on the college experience, or even that once you get narrowed down to like a specific school, you're going to have a sticker price on how much that experience is going to cost you, right, how much that investment in your in yourself and your degree and your education is going to cost you. The problem is that it's really hard to get that number because there are so many, uh, so many variable expenses within the paying for college experience, but also because two people could have a very similar course of study. And just based on some of the outside of the classroom decisions they make about where to live, um, what they're going to drive while they're in school, if they're going to have a roommate, books and supplies that they choose to get, how they choose to get those books and supplies, uh, that could drastically change their overall cost of college. But also decisions they make in the classroom could change that. So, uh, for example, one of the things that changes how much your, your total cost of college is, is how many upper division credits you're coming in at, coming in with and um and how that's going to change the cost of your of your total degree. So how do we get an estimate for for these kinds of things? Because it is important we teach 
We teach folks to understand the cost of what they're buying before they buy it. How do we do that with, with college? Well, uh, most universities are going to have some kind of price calculator. Uh, so if you are working with a student that knows that they want to go to, let's say, Ohio State, go to Ohio State's website and see how they're asking students to calculate this, because there could be specific guidelines within their process of how they charge students that they're going to want to know directly from the university. So an example is on the screen right now. Again, you can click these live links of how Penn State does this. There's a net price calculator um, that Penn State uses with prospective students to help give students an idea of total cost. Um, there's also some language in here that most of you should be familiar with, but that your EFC or your expected family contribution, this is an index, uh, that essentially families who fill out the FAFSA will receive this index. Um, and it is giving schools an indication of how much money that family has to contribute to college. Uh, it's based on a number of factors, taxable and untaxable income, benefits, uh, things like that. Uh, if you click on that estimated camp family contribution link, that's going to take you to studentaid.gov, which will, will explain in detail how um, more about how that's calculated and how you receive that. That's going to matter because a lot of these net price calculators are going to use an EFC or an estimated EFC to calculate how much um, school is going to cost and also how much scholarships, how many scholarships you might be eligible for. To give you an idea of what that looks like, here is you should be able to, to view the web page now of the net price calculator at Penn State. Again, just an example of what resources you might be able to direct students towards. It's incredibly important uh, to have these discussions about getting some of this information about EFC to students really early. Because I think one of the things, and I'll pepper this through these uh, sort of perceptions throughout, but one of the perceptions I have about students um, that I meet with and that our center meets with is that there is this idea um, before they get to school that there's going to be like enough scholarships and enough uh, aid available to them um, that it will kind of work itself out. And so they're sort of, it's very jarring when they arrive um, at school, they're probably moved into a dorm room. And that's when they start uh, realizing that there might not be enough aid provided uh, through mechanisms like federal student aid. Um, and so that they might have to do additional work to receive scholarships or find other sources of funding. And so you, you really can never do an EFC calculator too early because even if it's gonna change a little bit year to year based on family income, doing this with a sophomore or a freshman gives them an idea at least of like, okay, here's like the amount of money that you could potentially receive in federal aid. Um, and how does that relate to the cost of attendance for some of these schools you're considering? All right, now we're going to do a little bit of an activity. So in your Nearpod, you should be able to see, come back to Nearpod if you've been looking at a resource. In your Nearpod, you should see um, a document. This is from the uh, Department of the Treasury, Higher Education Financial Education Resource Updates 2023. This is really a resource guide. And the reason I wanted to share this is not normally part of this presentation, but I wanted to share this with you all because there's a lot of excellent calculators and resources in this guide that will aid you in developing curriculum or having critical conversations with students in high school, middle school, uh, or with families and they can answer some of the questions available to families and students. Um, so I'll just give you an idea. If you click into this, um, the Federal Student Aid Estimator I mentioned, one of the first resources listed on page three. College scorecard is listed um, here, right? So uh, provide students with information about federal aid and help them find college or career school that's going to be the best fit for them based on their choice of career path, um, how the FAFSA works. So I'm going to give you two minutes. I just want you to pick one of the resources in this seven page document. <laughs> okay. Pick one of the resources in the seven page document, click into it, give it a quick look. Ideally it's one you haven't seen before. 
And then in two minutes, we're going to come back together and I, we're going to have another cork board. And I want you to share uh, what resource you found and if you found it helpful, uh, where you might use this with a student, et cetera. All right. If you come back to Nearpod, oh, great, Michelle, you're already in there. Uh, keep looking at your resource. But if you come back to Nearpod, you're going to see the cork board up. Um, I just made a posting about what I went and looked at. I went to the Occupational Outlook Handbook that was on page four, I believe, of that resource guide. And I took a look, actually, I saw something that piqued my interest. It said highest paying occupations. I was like, I want to know that. <laughs> I went in and it it talked a little bit about most of these are going to be doctors, right? Making over 208K per year. Um, but you can go all the way down. You can you can rank it in different ways and show some of these different professions. Um, I might use that when working with a student, maybe a freshman student who comes in and says one of their financial goals is to be a really high income earner. And it's like, okay, well, what are you studying? I don't know what I'm studying. Maybe it's like, well, do, do you have an idea of what jobs pay? And we could go and use that tool potentially. I'm going to read out some of these as well. Consumer.gov site about personal loans. Mm -hmm. Prepaid cards. The loan simulator. Ah, is, I'm assuming, Kevin, that was at studentaid.gov loan simulator. Um, that is one of my. I'm a frequent flyer on that, on that website. Your financial path to graduation, Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. Yeah, fantastic. So hopefully keep that, keep that um, tab open on your, uh, on your browser so that you can come back to that resource once we're done with it. Um, and, and just, there are so many, there's such a wealth of, of resources to use with students and to put into some of your curriculum in there. All right, let's keep moving along. So um, one of the things that we try and stress to students, especially if they're already um, working with the center as a freshman right away because they're having trouble paying for college, is that they should look for the free money first. And they're often, they kind of look at us funny and like, well, of course I would look for the free money first, but it, it isn't always clear what we mean by that or where to find the free money. So we've developed this system of saying, okay, there's three buckets of funds um, that you can source to pay for your education. And these are the three most common buckets that folks, folks are using, but there's different types of things in each of this bucket, these buckets. And to make it even more confusing, they come from different sources, but several several of the items in each bucket actually come from the FAFSA. So when you apply for federal student aid, you might be getting different types of money, either saved, earned, freed, or borrowed from federal from the federal government or from similar sources like your school. So uh, it's important to understand kind of how these compare to each other, um, why we prioritize certain buckets over other buckets, but also what's available to you so that if you do find yourself in a position where you're struggling to pay for school, uh, knowing that you're exhausting all of your resources and all the types of funding. Before we get into this. So we have about a half hour left, and this is where I kind of want to see uh, where the conversation goes with this sort of unique group of, of educators. Uh, normally, I would go in and I'd explain every single type of, uh, of funding sources in these buckets, and we can absolutely do that. Um, I can absolutely take questions about how these different types of aid work, uh, where to find them, et cetera. Um, and I imagine we will do some of that. But I want to answer the question that I've been asked quite a bit, and I know Hillary has said it will be really important to this group of what are we seeing that students need to know that they're maybe not arriving at Penn State with, they're not arriving at higher ed with, in higher ed environment with. And in discussions with my team about this, you know, the thing that we see the most is actually not knowledge about these specific types of funding. That's not the thing preventing them from having a smooth experience pay for, paying for college. They might not know about these resources, but when they find out about them, uh, there's something else that's actually causing more trouble for them about paying for college than just awareness of these existing sources of funding. And these are soft skills. Um, soft skills to 
problem solve, to manage their time, to make decisions, to think critically about what funding they're going to use, and then to resource for themselves. And that is the thing that if those skills were really strong before they arrived at college uh, and, and in our office, we would be able to help them resource more effectively. So I wanted to take a quick moment and just ask this group, what soft skills, uh, soft skills are you seeing are most essential for soon-to-be students in college? See a comment coming in. We struggle every year to get our students to apply for scholarships. Maybe it's fear, fear of failure. They just don't apply. Right. This is exactly what I'm talking about is that there's, there's definitely a lack of financial knowledge, a lack of resource knowledge. But even if they know about the resource, there's a barrier. There's a soft skill, a self-advocacy that's missing. Hillary, you just said self-advocacy. I love that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hand, how do you problem solve when you encounter a problem? I need more money to pay for, pay for school. Or is this the right school for me right now because of the, the price? Um, is there another route I could take that would be less expensive or a better investment? Um, that's, that's something we ask students to consider a lot is there's many paths to a bachelor's degree. There's so many paths to a bachelor's degree and they all are going to have different sticker prices on them. And you, if you're making a wise investment, need to think about critics to have some critical decision-making skills surrounding which path is going to work for you and which is going to be the best investment, which is usually means you get something <laughs> without putting a ma the, the most amount of money into it, right? So the least amount of money for that bachelor's degree or master's degree or associate's degree. We don't know where to get information. Mm -hmm. Time management. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so that is, I think a message that I also want to communicate from our end as well is that, you know, it's not ever just enough to give people knowledge or to tell them that there is a skill available. We have to encourage students to practice that skill. So a student come into my office and, and say, I need to, I need to find funding to pay for this, this school year. And I can tell them about the funding available, but sometimes I have to help them practice the skill. I have to help them go to the website. And I realize that the first question is making them scared about like, tell us your mission statement. They're like, I don't even know what a mission statement is. So there's this, this troubleshooting and this um, resourcing that we need to make sure students are able to implement the knowledge and skills that we give them. Fear of, fail okay, Kevin, I love it. You turned that fear of failure, the skill would be resiliency. Okay, it's all right if you fail. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you submit that scholarship and you don't get it, right? It's all right. You tried and you probably learned something along the way. And the next time you submit a scholarship, you might get that one and you will have learned from, from trying it once before. Yep. So it's so important to address this. We can't just jump over this and talk about fill out the FAFSA and apply for scholarships when we don't, what, what we, what I think a lot of us are seeing are that students, even if they have that knowledge, there's still this barrier of confidence and, um, and soft skills that, that, that they have to implementing that step. So stick with your students long enough to know if that knowledge or that that's awareness of a skill is actually being implemented. Great, thank you all for sharing. These are just really great comments. I knew I would, I would learn as much in this session as I was going to present. So I said that I would um, work through some of those buckets and I will. Uh, I'm gonna go at a pretty good clip but I also want you guys to start using the uh, question and answer while I'm working through these steps so that while I'm in a certain area of aid, you, if you have a question about it, I can address it right then. So I think Hillary is still with us in the call. And so she will alert me if I miss a question coming in. Is that all right, Hillary? Um, and yep. So throw your questions in and we will address them as we go. I've got this ready, set, go. Um, <laughs> image up on the screen because talking about financial aid, 
uh, can be a really slippery slope and you can get in the weeds really quickly. Happy to do that, but I'm not going to force that upon, <laughs> upon you if that's not what you came here to learn about. So I'm going to do a quick overview of the financial aid cycle, ask questions as you have them, and then we're going to jump into those other buckets of funding. So quick overview of the financial aid cycle. Parents and family, parents and students will create FAFSA IDs, one for the parent, one for the student if the student is under 24 years old. They'll complete the FAFSA in October, the year before they're trying to go to school. So for a lot of K-12 folks, this is going to be their senior year, October of their senior year. Doing that early is a great idea. Again, getting that information back about what is your EFC, how is the school going to be providing aid to you, and how much aid. Uh, it's not automatic from there. Students need to decide what aid uh, they're going to ac accept from what the school offered them, and then they'll pay their bill. Usually, the bills are due within the first couple weeks of school at any at any university. Um, to maintain academic progress, meaning that there are certain standards the federal government sets. Uh, to make sure that students will remain eligible for things like student loans. Uh, the student needs to be making certain academic progress or, uh, regarding PACE and GPA. So uh, they there are standards set within that. There are safety nets under that as well. So if a student is struggling right away, it's not like they will immediately lose eligibility. Then this cycle continues every single year that the student looks for aid um, while they're enrolled. Uh, and then when they exit their degree, uh, their degree, uh, ideally from graduating, then you start the student loan repayment process, which is a whole beast in and of itself. We have a lot of resources surrounding how to effectively pay off student loans, how to effectively navigate loan forgiveness, uh, how to manage those two in conjunction, um, and then also what to do if you find yourself unable to repay your student loans. Uh, our center provides a lot of resources around that, which we're not going to get into a ton today, but I'm happy to answer questions about, and feel free to go to our website and view some of our um, specific content on that. So that first bucket that we tell students to look at, free money, this is mostly going to be grants and scholarships. They don't just come from one place, though. It's not like you just fill out the FAFSA and you're going to get offered every grant or scholarship available to you. Um, some grants do come through the school, through the federal aid process, the most common being Pell Grant. Uh, these are for lower EFC families are going to be offered a maximum award of $6,895. That was this year. We're hoping to see that increase in the future. Um, there are also other grants that might be automatically given through the school or through the through the financial aid office, uh, but it is always worth visiting the financial aid office website of the school they're attending to see what is and is not automatically considered for the student in the form of grants. Scholarships are a whole other beast onto themselves because some scholarships are going to come from financial aid, some are going to come from other outside resources. So paying attention to what scholarships you're eligible for and where to find those scholarships is critical. This is a great one to click on if you haven't utilized the clicking and clicking link uh, feature of Nearpod. So where are scholarships? They're coming from a lot of different locations. A lot of scholarships, I said, will come from the FAFSA. So just filling out the FAFSA and submitting it to your school of choice will give students an idea of what the school automatically consider them for and put in their financial aid package. Uh, there are institutional scholarships. So this gets even more confusing. It's Let's say we'll use Penn State as an example. So financial aid office sends out automatic scholarships that the student might have received, but there might be institutional scholarships that require a separate application, even though they're school-wide for whatever reason. So those institutional scholarships need a different application process, might have a different deadline, uh, and those need to be resource researched as well and resourced by students early on um, in their senior year to just know that they're meeting all the deadlines for those. Let's make it even more complicated, right? There's individual departments and colleges. They're gonna offer scholarships to their unique population. So if a student knows that they're going to be studying journalism, they will need to fill out the FAFSA. They might want to apply for some big institutional scholarships. But then additionally, they need to look at their department and see if their department has special scholarships just for students in that pool. 
Well, why is it so important to do that uh, if I've already applied for the bigger scholarships? Well, in some cases, you're you're a big fish in a small in a small pond for a department or um, a college scholarship, a unique college scholarship. So applying for those, you have a better chance of receiving them. And then finally, external scholarships. Go ahead. If you click that link, it's going to take you to a resource, but I believe our next page. Yeah. So external scholarships, there are so many types of external scholarships out there. The best advice I can give for searching for those scholarships is, is two, two methods. The first would be use a national scholarship directory or search engine, like the ones listed on the screen at FastWeb uh, is one we often direct students to. This is going to help filter scholarships for you. So think of it as a scholarship search engine. The other thing you can do is either using FastWeb or just on your own, try and narrow the pool of what scholarships are available to you. So if you are a first-gen student studying um, behavioral economics and you also, um, what's another sort of, you live in a rural area, <laughs> Go ahead and search for students interested in behavioral economics coming from a rural area, first gen, right? And see what comes up. See what scholarships are available to someone just like you nationwide. You're going to have a, a higher likelihood of being able to earn those scholarships or be competitive for those scholarships. When in doubt, though, start at least with doing a national search um, on one of these larger uh, scholarship search engines as well and find something that matches you. Uh, one of the things we like about fast web is that you can select some of these unique factors um, and filter for those as well. All right, the next bucket, save money. Um, we highlight 529 plans here because it's important to know that the paying for college process is both about you while you're a student, but if you are maybe a non-traditional student or a master's degree student, you might already have a family. And so you are looking at saved money for your degree, but also how can you make college affordable for your children in the future? Pennsylvania has two 529 plans that are excellent options to resource. Um, if you just search 529 plans PA, you'll be able to find a lot of information about those plans, um, making college more affordable for your children. Uh, and then also relying on personal savings. Uh, so preparing ahead. And, and this is where it's also important to make sure that you're having discussions with parents in a K-12 environment about what personal savings uh, can they contribute to their uh, child's degree, uh, but also if there, if that is not available, having that conversation with the child really early on. Um, this is one of those pieces of financial coaching where, where we see it in, in one-on-ones sometimes that students weren't aware of, of what their parents were going to contribute or if their parents were going to contribute in the future. And so having that conversation before the student even starts looking at schools can be really important to uh, having a smooth paying for college experience. Making a family spending plan. Um, again, really important to do early and reconsider often as you're going through your degree. Uh, looking at summer job opportunities with students so that they can contribute a little bit of money towards their degree and, and also encouraging them to um, search for jobs while they're on campus. There's a lot of research out there showing that students that have a job on campus or while they're in school uh, are better at time management and balancing uh, their career and their job and kind of giving a little bit more of financial buy-in to their degree. All right, so here's another lineup of those two PA 529 plans I mentioned. Definitely worth considering if you have a family and you live in Pennsylvania or really wherever you're living. Um, there are usually, I think 529 plans are in every single state. I probably should double check that before I say it, but I'm pretty sure 529 plans are available in most states. Um, so investigate that option. All right, final bucket of that earned money. Um, so federal work study. 
Federal work study is available through filing the FAFSA, but students have to indicate that they're interested in work study on the FAFSA to receive those opportunities. And this is something that on the higher ed financial educator end or even financial aid end, it's it's hard to communicate that with senior students um, if, when you're not with them filling out the FAFSA. So making sure that they're at least leaving the door open to receive work study opportunities is something that whoever is running a FAFSA night and in, um, or involved in financial education uh, in high school needs to make sure students understand what that option is because it's really easy to just click, no, not interested. Uh, work study is essentially, it's um, flexible part-time jobs that will be available to the student um, if they're eligible for work study and they will earn income from these jobs through their paychecks, they actually have to go and get the job, but the money itself um, is exempt from FICA taxes. It also prioritizes for a lot of units, um, hires of work study students. So what I mean by that is that if I can only hire one student um, that's not work study or two students that are work study because that's going to be supplemented by this, these work study funds, I'm more likely to hire the two students that are work study eligible students. So it gives, it incentivizes offices on campus to hire work study students. And there's that benefit of um, being uh, some, some tax exemption on the student's behalf as well. So I always say, click that box unless you're certain you will never want a job on campus. Um, this next box of earned money is, is, I get a lot of questions about, so feel free to ask more questions. Uh, essentially what I want you to hear is that a lot of folks do not pay for degrees, right? Especially when you get into master's and doctoral programs, there are a lot of graduate assistantships, teaching assistantships, research assistants. Um, and, and it's important to do your homework on this because you don't want to be sitting in a degree program next to somebody who's not paying a dime or paying way less than you for that same degree because they did their homework on what teaching um, and graduate assistantships were available. Um, so do, do your research, talk to your department, talk to your professors, See if you can create opportunities for yourself and don't just assume that the price that is given to you of how much the, how much tuition is going to be is what everybody is paying, right? There are going to be options. You just have to leave no stone unturned um, on, on what assistance ships could be available to you or even what dependent or staff waivers might be available to you. So looking at schools where you might receive other benefits, let's say you, your parent or your spouse works at that school. Um, that is a perfectly reasonable uh, uh, line of thinking on where you go to school is based on, well, is this a better investment because I can get some kind of massive discount? So uh, consider those options and don't just think that it's a small amount of opportunities for a very select few. Uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, funding is available. You just need to ask about it. All right, and then finally, we're coming up on the hour, so I'm probably going to end at this slide so that we have enough time for open questions, but borrowed money. Borrowed money comes in the form of federal student loans and private student loans. So federal student loans would be those loans issued um, after applying for, uh, applying through the FAFSA from the Department of Education. So they're government issued. Generally, you're going to see lower interest rates, fixed interest rates. Um, there are a lot of benefits to having federal student loans. I, I talk to students about it as though it's like there's a million safety nets, not a million, there's several safety nets under federal loan programs that are not gonna exist in the private sector with a private student loan, which would come from a private lender, a bank, a credit union that you're working with. Um, interest rates can really vary depending on uh, your the, what comes back from your credit check, uh, the, the lender themselves, um, and also the amount that you're borrowing for. Uh, generally, those loans are not going to have a lot of the um, options that a federal student loan is going to have, such as loan forgiveness or income-driven repayment plans, or even subsidized loans where the government is going to be paying interest on those loans while you're in school. So 
we tell students to consider those federal student loan options first. And then if they are looking at private student loans, just to make sure they're comparing apples to apples, they're looking at interest rates. They're considering whether it's fixed or variable. Um, they're looking at if it's a better idea for the student or the parent to borrow the loan. Um, we, we have a lot of conversations uh, with families about the best course of action to finance a, a undergraduate degree um, and make sure that they're they're finding the best loan possible and that they've shopped all options. So I'll pause there. I want to leave five minutes for questions. Happy to dive further into any of these buckets, but I, I'm I'm really happy with the amount of engagement that you all showed um, today and and kind of sharing what we're seeing. Um, in the paying for college space. So let me open it up to Q&A from here. You can use the chat or the Q&A um, function in Zoom. Julie, this has been great. I uh, I have really, really enjoyed this, this conversation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again while, while we let some folks percolate on some questions um, and also, um, just mentioned that, you know, um, I, I will confess having, and, and I think you and I have chatted about this before, but um, having lived in the world of financial education, this has always been a hot topic for me, but never so much as this year with a high school junior living in my house, um, as we are really, really kicking into this, um, you know, seeing, I would say a lot more sort of, you know, firsthand um, experience with with our own, um, you know, friends and um, and uh, and his friends that are a little bit older, going through a lot of this, um, you know, right now uh, ahead of us. Um, so I I I appreciate it both both personally and professionally. Uh, yeah. The more, the, more, the more that we dig in and have opportunities to this, to discuss this, so it's also a good empathy builder when some of these financial literacy and wellness topics hit us in our own lives. And we realize how hard it is to implement <laughs> this wise decision making we've been dispelling out to the community, right? Because when your kid says, I want to go to this school, I have to go to this school, or I will be devastated, mom. That feels a lot different to you in that moment than it might have felt, you know, years before of like, my kid's never going to go to an expensive school like that. They're just going to get this degree that's available to them, affordable. And that's why these decisions are hard for consumers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, or our shared alma mater, which is an out-of-state school now for both of us, but that's a whole nother story for another. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's no other question there, so I will answer that one. That's a good one. Out-of-state versus in-state. Let's talk about that one. So you, for, first thing is, um, if you are sold on going to an out-of-state school, you're not, it's not, you're not dead in the water there, right? You can, you can find ways and encourage your student to do some things to get that in-state tuition. So I'll give you an example. I used to live in Montana. A lot of students want to come out of state to go skiing while they go to, to get their bachelor's degree. If you live in the state of Montana and work for one year and get your license there and transfer all of your documentation there for one year, you are able to take advantage of in-state tuition, which is a fraction of the cost, right? And so it is, it's all about critical decision-making right? Compare, uh, being able to practice those soft skills and helping them develop that and saying, okay, is it worth $50,000 for you to start right now? Or could you take a community class, one community class a, a semester for the next year while you're saving some money and working at the ski hill to save yourself $50,000? You could go to Europe three times, right? And trying to bring that home for them of like, what does this mean? And can you still accomplish your goal in multiple creative ways? So that's something I would, I would share too, whatever it is, whether it's in-state or another option, but be creative, be a creative thinker, find out all your options. Yeah. And I think it's been fascinating. I've been learning more and more about, you know, how you know, that some states have reciprocity in some ways a little bit with some of their um, uh, in-state versus out-of-state. Some states are much more, much easier to become um, qualified for in-state tuition than others. Yep. It really is tremendous. And so, you know, leave, I guess that's, I, I guess if there's a, um, you know, a, a key takeaway, it's that 
you know, leave no stone unturned, right? No stone um, unturned. Mm -hmm. And maybe so, maybe that, that, um, you know, we talked about the self skills, soft skills earlier, but, um, you know, that um, persistence, right? Like that, you know, don't just do it once, but, you know, do it again and again and again. Yeah. Um, diligence, resiliency. This is yeah. life. This is taxes. You got to do taxes. You got to jump through these hoops and there will be a payoff from doing that. And right. And students will learn that as they go through their life that like, okay, if I put the work in, it works out, but yeah, that's a great point, Hillary. Absolutely. Um, and we had a comment, um, from one of our educators, um, noting how much, uh, they liked the, the bucket idea. Um, I think that really helps, you know, to sort of like bring it down to, you know, there's this bucket, this bucket and this bucket, right. You know, that kind of thing for students, um, or for anybody really makes it a little bit more manageable. Like, okay, I can, I can get, and I can understand these big pictures and then, you know, looking at things, you know, sort of within, within each of those categories. Yeah. Exhaust all the free money options first. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much, Julie. I appreciate it. Um, I'm going to just uh, you know, want to just say thank you on behalf of all of our participants for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's always great to to tackle some of these challenging uh, topics and and think about it through both lenses. You know, right? Both what what students need to know and what we as educators and how we can you know really work work collaboratively. So thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. Absolutely. Always a pleasure. So before I sign off, just one more um, plug for our three work, um, week virtual workshop that is coming up um, starting this week. Again, um, there is no time frame for when you have to go in and do things. This, or there's no schedule. So um, if you sign up and say, hey, I'm not going to have any time except for maybe like one weekend. Fine. Um, join us for as much or as little of that um, of that time as you can. Um, we will look forward to um, uh, seeing what you have to share and for you being able to just dive in and seeing what everybody else um, has to offer. So, um, again, encourage you to, to sign up for that and share that information with um, fellow educators. Again, also those additional webinars that we have coming up and the book study.